So let's try and summarize, uh, maybe go back to our picture. Because we may have to skip a few things, but we're getting to what many of you have heard of. You hear about mining, Bitcoin mining. So that's what we're getting to and, and what it involves. But so far we know that we have transactions. Everything is a transaction. And someone checks, so we have a log of transactions and once those transactions are entered into the public log, the, the true log of transactions, then new transactions can be created which refer to them, which spend the Bitcoin. So we saw that a transaction created 30 Bitcoin for Tanarak, transaction 3 spent that 30 Bitcoin, sending 5 to Steve and sending the chain of change of 25 back to Tanarak. So each transaction spends big Bitcoins. And we build up millions of transactions over time. Now, one of the problems is what's called double spending. I have just received, I think if we go through these transactions, you'll see I received 2 plus 5. I have 7 Bitcoin to my name. I have 7 Bitcoin. If I was to cheat, what I would like to do is be able to say, OK, let's create one transaction that sends 7 Bitcoin to one person to pay them for something they've just sent me. And let's create another transaction that sends 7 Bitcoin to someone else. Okay, Double spend. I spend, I've only got 7, but I spend it twice. That shouldn't be allowed, but that's something that some, a cheat may try to do. We need to stop that. So I create two transactions, spending all my Bitcoin. And the, the way that the system works is that when a transaction enters the network, not everyone has to verify it. So I create a transaction, I send it to some other computers in the network, they try and verify it with respect to the log. Not everyone must verify that one transaction. In fact, only one person needs to verify it eventually. So what I do to try and cheat the system is send one transaction to this area of the network, send the other transaction over here with the hope that both of those transactions will be accepted. Because this part of the network doesn't know about the other transaction and this part doesn't know about the, the vice versa. The, the, the second transaction. So I hope that both transactions will be accepted and effectively I've spent my money twice. That's bad. So we need to stop that. Now why would two different groups of people verify different transactions without knowing about the others? Remember it's the internet. It's a distributed system. No one is connected to everyone else. You're only connected to a, a set of users, a small subset, such that you're not aware of what everyone else is doing. If it was a centralized system, the, the bank would verify all transactions in order. But in a distributed system, entities may be verifying separately and independently. So we need to somehow maintain ordering such that if I create two transactions to double spend my money, one of them will be verified first, therefore the others will know that the second transaction must be rejected. That's what we want. And one way to do that is that we introduce some sort of delay into the system so it takes some time to verify. And that's what we're trying to get to. Uh, but in fact, we now not talk about verifying individual transactions, we talk about creating a block of transactions. So there are many transactions every second. There are, there are many transactions, new transactions occurring. And what we do is we group them into a block. And then a block will refer to, the next block will refer to other previously created blocks, where blocks contain verified transactions. Okay, so let's say all the transactions that have currently been verified are included in the blockchain, a chain of blocks. Now there's some new transactions. What we do is we group them into a block and try and create that block to add to the chain. 
once it's added to those, that chain, those transactions included will be considered verified or confirmed. Maybe a picture will capture this before we go into the technical details. Let's see if we can talk about it in a picture. Uh, this concept of a block and a blockchain. So now the first block contains the very first transactions when Bitcoin was created. And there's some special cases. How did you create the first transaction and verify it? Let's ignore it. Let's assume the first block was created. A block is a data structure that refers to the previous block. It's like a linked list or a list. There's a pointer to the previous block, except for the first one. It's called the genesis block. Block 1 refers to block 0. And the block in the data structure also refers to the transactions inside that. So a set of transaction IDs. How many? It varies. Today it's usually in the order of hundreds, two or three hundred. We'll see some numbers later. So what happens? New transactions are created. They are sent out to people to try and verify. And what people do, people, other users in the network, so let's say we already have four blocks, block zero up to block three. They've been created, they refer to verified transactions. Then there's some new transactions. These, here, yeah, transaction 22, 23, and so on. And there are two different users, user one and user two. We'll see, we'll call them mi miners. We'll explain why later, but two different users. What they are trying to do is they take some of those unverified transactions, those that aren't yet in the list, and they include them into a block and try and create a new block to add to the chain. Okay. So miner 1 creates a data structure containing a header which points to block 3, includes some transactions. They don't have to be the same transactions, just some transactions. Miner 2 does the same on his computer on the other side of the world. Creates a block with a header and some in transactions and then they perform some operations to, to mine this block, to create the block. And the operations are set up such that it will take some time. It requires your computer to do some work. It takes uh, some time. We'll talk about the time later but minutes, hours if you have a slow computer. So both of these computers are trying to create the next block in the chain. There's a, it's only a linear chain. There should just be one next block. So let's say miner 1, I think, has... So first, each of these computers check the transactions, make sure the signatures are correct, the money's correct, the amounts are correct, everything's correct, and they do some operations to create the next block. And let's say Miner 1 has the fastest computer in this case. Miner 1 wins. That is, they create the block, they solve some problem. We'll come back to what that problem is later, but they solve some computational problem. And they create the block and they tell everyone in the network, I've created block number 4. Okay? And everyone checks, it's very easy to check that it's a valid block, and this block 4 and the transactions within become verified. They added to our transaction log. That becomes the next block in the blockchain. This assumed miner 1 created that block first. They, they won some competition. Miner 2, when they realize that miner 1 created the block, they finish first. Miner 2 gives up. They stop creating their block because there's no longer a, a motivation to do it. Well, what's the motivation? It turns out whoever creates the next block in the chain gets 25 bitcoins. Today, 25 bitcoins is about 16,000, is that right? 16,000 dollars, US dollars. So the, the person or people who create the next block in the chain gets this special transaction of no input, output is you. That is, you get a reward of 25 bitcoins if you create the next block. So there's the motivation of why people would try and create blocks, because they get some financial reward. 
So both of these were trying to create the next block. Whoever does gets 25 Bitcoin. Miner 1 got there first. They get the 25 Bitcoin. Each block must refer to the previous block. So Miner 1 creates the block, sends a message to everyone, I've created block 4. Miner 2 receives a message, damn, someone beat me to it. Okay? And he gives up. Why does he give up? Because there's no longer a reward, a reward for block 4. The next block must point to block 4. The, comp the, the computation was such that Miner 2 is doing some computation and that computation refers to block 3. But once block 4 is created, you, know, has to, you have to restart that computation because your computation must, must now refer to block 4. You can't continue with the old one because, well you can, but you'll never get the reward. So Miner 2 gives up and now he creates some more or gets a group of transactions and goes to work trying to create block 5, as do other miners. And whoever creates the next block is added to the chain and they tell everyone, I've created the next block. Everyone, it's very quick to check. It's broadcast through some network. Once you learn someone else has created the next block, then you give up what you were doing and then move on to the next block to try and win that competition. So why create blocks? Because you get some reward. You get some financial reward that motivates the people to do it. And it's important that each block must refer to the previous block in the chain. So that if you are working, but then you learn someone else just completed block four, then there's no benefit in you continuing on this one because block four is already existing and your new block must point to block four, so you must restart. The computation of creating a block has an input as the block ID, the previous block ID. So when the previous block ID changes, you must restart your computation. Now, is the internet. It may happen such that two blocks are mined at the same time. Miner one and miner two are going to work. They both find the next block they're both separate at the same time. And they both tell everyone, I've created a new block. Sort of, it's a draw. It's a tie in the competition. They tell everyone, so Miner 1 created block 4, let's call it 4A, and Miner 2 created block 4B. Now this can be a problem, because what that says is that from our system, Someone's saying that these transactions are being verified, but someone else is saying that these other set of transactions are being verified. This is, we start to, what do we call it? Uh, we get a fork in the chain. Okay. Now what happens? This is possible. It turns out in practice very, very uncommon that two sets of users create the next block at the same time and then tell everyone and everyone believes them. Usually it's one of them comes first. Okay. But if it does happen, then people then start creating the next block, block 5. Some of them will refer to block 4B and others will refer to block 4A. Again, when you create a block, you get a reward. And when you create a block, you must point to a previous block. So some people are trying to create this block, which will point to 4A. Others are trying to create this one, which will point to 4B. The one that wins will create the block. If, let's say, this group or this person wins and creates block 5, the system will then disregard this block. It will remove it from the chain. So if we get this special case where two users create a block at the same time, it's possible, but usually it's fixed shortly later. And it's fixed because now people are trying to create the next block, and let's say one of them wins. One of them gets there first. This one does. So now block five, so the other users who want to create block six, what they do is they normally take the longest chain. So now we have 
remove this red cross, but we have this chain and this chain, and then the next block needs to be created. Well, users choose the longest chain. That's the rule, to, to continue from the longest chain. What happens to the 25 and, and yeah, what happens here? This block is moves from previously created and transactions verified to be uh, orphaned and the transactions are no longer verified. So they're back, put back into the pool of transactions that need to be verified. So yes, transactions in here, which are not in the other blocks, will need to be verified again. Okay, so that's the problem, or that's what happens with these ones. And that's coming to this issue of, okay, a transaction occurs. I make a payment to someone. Okay. At what time do you believe that you've got that money? Well, you want your, that transaction to be, to be included in a block. Okay. Let's say my transaction was, okay, to pay Dana a uh, thousand Bitcoin and I'm going to pay him that and he's going to send me a car. Okay. I'm buying a car from him. So when does he send me the car? Once he's got the money. But how does he know he's got the money? Well, let's say it was transaction 22. Then at this point, transaction 22 has been included in a block. Okay, good. Let's say it was transaction 22. So therefore, he sends me the car because his transaction of receiving that 1,000 Bitcoin has been accepted by the system. So he believes he's got the money. And fine, the next block. And then this transaction remains in the log. Remember, it's all about a log of transactions, trusted transactions. But what if his transaction was 27? Transaction 27, it's verified here. So he sends me the car thinking he just got 1,000 Bitcoin. But then slightly later, this transaction is converted back to unverified. That doesn't count that transaction. He hasn't got the Bitcoin. I've got the car. So. The block takes about 10 minutes. So, so yeah. There's, a, there's essentially a 9 minute window. Uh, so a block, it turns out, takes about 10 minutes to verify. Every 10 minutes, a new block is created. So, when does the receiver believe that they've got the money? One rule has been once six blocks after it, after that transaction had been created. Let's say in this case, the block containing his transaction has been created. If he believes he's got the money at this point in time, he may be very unlucky and that this block is, sorry, is rejected because of a fork in the chain. So to be, increase your confidence that the block is going to remain and the transaction remain, wait until the chain is such that there are six blocks from when your transaction occurs. Because that means that it's very unlikely that your, that block containing the transaction is going to be rejected because of the way that they always choose the longest block, okay. uh, the block chain, the longest chain. It's getting confusing, uh, so some practical things there. About 10 minutes to create a block. When do you believe the transaction has been confirmed? Well, it's up to you, but a general rule is six blocks. Once six blocks after your transaction have been confirmed, then that's very, very unlikely that you're going to have that transaction rejected. In some cases, it's, you, you can make it longer. In some cases, it's 100 blocks. And in practice, these forks, I'll show you some stat statistics later, very few happen. So very few times does a block get rejected. So it's possible in theory, but in practice it turns out that usually one, there's only one chain. Uh, so if it's six blocks and 10 minutes per block, that, that's one hour. Transaction occurs about one hour later, you can think, I've got the, it's safe to say you've got the money. So there is some delay there. It was due, I guess, in 2012, where two separate uh, 
where a port was created and not repaired. Uh, uh, two separate, for almost uh, 13 hours, there's two separate uh, generations. Of yes. Uh, so what happens is, let's say, uh, how do we get to? So we have a fork here. We've got two parallel chain of blocks. Then the next one, they happen at the same time. And then the next one happens at the same time. And it keeps going. Then we keep this parallel. And we have this problem in this case that it's possible to have a transaction that double spends. And that's bad. So the longer that we have two parallel chains, uh, the more chance it is for someone to, to double spend. But even then, it's, uh, it's still possible to go back and revert. Yeah, so it creates a problem. Yeah. They downgraded the software. Yeah. They suspended trading until, uh, yeah. until they pushed the revert. Yeah. yeah, there thing. was a problem with the version of the software, I think, that, uh, such that there was a parallel chain created. And eventually, one of those forks had to be deleted, which effectively uh, invalidates all those transactions which causes a major inconvenience to people who thought they got money but actually didn't. Well, of course, that Im impacts on the, the value of things as well. Yeah. Uh, what can happen if you do have a parallel chain is that, uh, let's say back here, transaction 38, I received from some other transaction one bitcoin. Okay? I, re I have one bitcoin, that's all I have. I create two different transactions, 427 and 435. Both of them refer to 38. And both of them I'm spending one Bitcoin. This is double spending. I have one Bitcoin from here, and I've got two different transactions trying to spend that one Bitcoin. One sending to Pekini, one sending to Tanarak. If this transaction is verified in this block, in this fork of the chain, and this other one here, then Pekini thinks she's got one Bitcoin from me. Tanarak thinks he's got one Bitcoin from me. But I only had one to start with, so both of them can't get one. So that's the problem that we get if we have two parallel chains. Now, if block seven is created here, then this chain is, or this fork is removed. All these transactions are invalidated and then Tanarak doesn't get his one Bitcoin. So it works in that case. But of course, if Tanarak has tried to spend that one Bitcoin somewhere else, then that creates a problem. Okay, so the problem with this fork is that double spending is possible. But uh, it's very unlikely in practice. Uh, I'll show you statistics in a moment. Let's go to the, hopefully the last main thing why do why create blocks? And creating blocks is called mining. We create blocks to keep this transaction log uh, consistent. Everyone agrees upon the same set of transactions. If people are agreeing upon different sets of transactions, we get the problem like double spending. So the way the system is set up is that to create a new block takes some effort. And to, cre to, to create the block, you need to prove that you did work, this concept of proof of work. How is it done? The users that create new blocks are called miners. This is Bitcoin mining. What do they need to do? So what they do is they create, they collect a set of transactions. That's easy. Then they create a data structure, the block header, which includes some information about those transactions. And that data structure must include a value of a special, uh, a, a special value. And this is how it works. Uh, the, block, the block data structure, we must be able to take a hash of that block data structure and get a number that is less than some cutoff. Now, coming back to hash functions, so using SHA-256, 
with SHA-256 there, 2 to the power of 256 possible values. 256 bits long, meaning 2 to the power of 256 possible values. And SHA is effectively a random number generator. If I take some input, I'll get a random number as output, a 256-bit random number. If I change the input by just one bit, I'll get a different random number as output. Okay. The input in this case is the block header, just some 80 or so bytes. It's not big, but it's some stru data structure that refers to the previous block. Now, the block header must be such that when we take a hash of that, we'll get a number which is less than some other number, which is defined here. We take the block header, we calculate the hash of the block header, and we get the block ID. Effectively a random number, the block ID. is the hash of the block header. It must be less than this value, which is 2 to the power of 256 divided by some difficulty factor times 2 to the power of 32. If the block ID is less than this, then you've created the block. If not, you must change a value inside the block header, there's a counter field that you can change, and retry, calculate the hash, you'll get a different random number, a different block ID. If it's less than this, you've created the block and you've won. If it's more than this value, then you need to try again, and you try again until you get a number less. Let's look at that and see how that works. Coming back, I think. The block header contains the ID of the previous block. So if we're trying to create blocks, block 6, the header contains block 5, the ID. The list of transactions, some other information, the difficulty factor, but importantly a counter, some, some value that we can set to anything. So what we do to mine a block, I create this data structure, I set the counter, let's say, to zero. I calculate the hash of these values. I get a number. If that number is less than our cutoff, then I've created the block. And I've, I've won the competition. If it's more than that cutoff, then I change my counter value to a different value, take a hash again, and if it's less than the, the cutoff, I've got the block. If not, try again and again and again. How long does it take or what effort does it require? Remember, calculating the hash of some input generally or well, effectively produces a random number. Our random number, the block ID, must be less than this. Do I have an example? Here's an example. Currently, the difficulty factor is about 2 to the power of 34. Therefore, our block ID, or our random number, must be less than 2 to the 256 divided by 2 to the 34 times 2 to the 32. Do the calculation, it's 2 to the power of 190. That is, my block ID must be a value less than 2 to the power of 190. So what I do is I take a hash of the block header, I get a random number. If the number is 1, I win. It's less than 2 to the power of 190. If it's a large number greater than this, I must try again. And I'll get a di different block ID and keep trying until it's less than this. And the way that I produce a different header is I change the counter. Now, let's look at the statistics here. How many possible outputs are there of the hash? 2 to the power of 256. SHA-256 produces a random number of 256 bits in length. Therefore, this is the number of possible values. Of all those possible values, I need one of them which is less than 2 to the power of 190. So, What's the probability of choosing a random number from some range? This is the range. And that number must be less than this. Well, it's 2 to the minus, 2 to the power of minus 66. Okay. 
I'm sure you do this in your head. Uh, quite simply, if we choose from, uh, if you choose from 10 numbers, a random number, what's the chance of it being less than or equal to 4? So choose between 1 to 10, the chance of being less than or equal to 4. Well, you either choose 1, 2, 3 or 4. You've got 40% chance. Okay. So the same logic applies here. You can work out the probability. It's the total set, or it's the, the, the cutoff divided by the total set, which is this. And because it's random numbers, how many attempts do we need to take to get that probability of 1? Well, 2 to the power of 66. On average, I need 2 to the power of 66 different attempts to get a number less than 2 to the power of 190. And now back again, 1 to 10 it needs to be less than or equal to 4. You choose a random, random number, you choose 7. Okay, it's not, so you try again, you choose 3. Okay, we got it in two attempts. If you keep doing that, on average, how many attempts does it take? Well, this is what we're calculating here, 2 to the power of 66. So, to create a block, what you do is you create the block header and you keep changing the counter. And on average, because it's choosing random numbers, you, you cannot control the output. On average, it takes, in this case, 2 to the power of 66 operations. Each operation is calculating a hash. So how long does it take your computer to do this? 2 to the power of 66 is 7 by 10 to the 19. So think of a loop. It runs that many times. Each loop calculates a hash. How long does it take to do this depends upon how fast your hardware is. My, I tried it this morning, my laptop can do uh, one million. I've got the number. I'll show you. This is my laptop. I'll show you the number in a moment. It's doing many hashes. And this is the number. On a small input size, it did in, uh, it'll stop in a moment and we'll be able to read it. I'll highlight. My laptop, I'll focus on this line. In three seconds, 2.99 seconds, my laptop did, what's this, 2.5 million hashes. Let's round it up to 3 million hashes. 3 million hashes in 3 seconds is 1 million hashes per second. My laptop can do 1 million hashes per second. Your laptop may be different, okay? But say 1 million hashes per second. We need to do 7 by 10 to the power of 19 hashes. How many seconds? Well, 7 by 10 to the 19 divided by 1 million. Anyone have the answer? The number of hashes is 7 times 10 to the power of, what do we say, 17, 19, and my speed is, for me, was 1 million per second, 10 to the power of 6. This one will do. That's how many seconds it would take. How many minutes? How many hours? Sorry. How many days? How many years? How many centuries? Oh, 22,000 centuries it would take my laptop to find a block. The reward I get for getting one block is 25 bitcoins. It's about $16,000. So if I wait for 22 centuries, I will get $16,000. Okay? Or right, we have a problem. So, mining is creating a block. And the way to create a block, the, the rules are that you need to create a hash of the block header 
which is less than some value. The value is fixed except it depends upon some changing difficulty factor. And that changes effectively as the speed of hardware and the number of people mining change, this difficulty factor goes up and down. It increases, making it such that today, if I use my laptop, take 22,000 centuries, but what people do is they combine many different hardware devices into a group and all mine together. And the current rate is that groups of people are doing about 10 to the power of 17 hashes per second. My laptop did 10 to the power of 6, but in the internet with people grouping together they're doing about 10 to the power of 17 per second, which takes about 700 seconds or about 11 minutes. And that, as the, the hardware speed increases, the difficulty factor increases, which makes it such that it's designed such that the time it takes is roughly about 10 minutes to create one block to solve this problem takes about 10 minutes, no matter how good the hardware is. Five years ago it took 10 minutes, today it takes 10 minutes because the, the network automatically adjusts, adjusts the difficulty factor such that if there's a great increase in the, the hash rate from 10 to the power of 17 up to 10 to the power of 18 overnight, then the difficulty factor changes so that it still takes about 10 minutes to create a block. But this is in total, this is not on one computer, this is 10 minutes with maybe thousands of people using dedicated hardware all trying to create one block, a pool, a pool of miners. Okay. Questions? It's with time running short. I think today we, a lot of the details we maybe you will not understand, mainly because I don't understand some of them as well. Like I said, I uh, spent the last two or three days learning this. Okay? I haven't used Bitcoin before, so uh, that's why it may be hard to convey the, the details to you. But some of the things that you've heard of in the press and in, in general maybe will start to make sense uh, now. Not all of it, but maybe we need another three or six hours to go through and, and explain in depth. So, this difficulty factor is designed such that it takes about 10 minutes to mine each block. And this value is adjusted every two weeks. They, the system does a calculation. How long did it take to, to mine the previous blocks? And then adjust the difficulty factor such that in the next two weeks it's going to take about 10, 10 minutes per block. So it automatically adjusts. So this is block mining. The block mining is creating that block and it requires a lot of computational effort. If you do it on your own computer, well, using your CPU, impossible. Well, it's possible, but what happens? I start mining on my computer. But everyone else is mining using their computers and their, their groups of computers. So I'm never going to win. I'm never going to be faster than someone else. Someone else is always going to get the block before me. I do not get a reward, but I spent that 10 minutes processing using power, electricity. Um, so mining on your own computer is not worthwhile. In the past, when the difficulty factor was quite low, it was possible to mine on your own computer. It was possible to win, but now the, the capabilities of others is such that it's very hard to win. So why mine blocks? When you mine blocks, you're using hardware. Okay, you need to buy the computer. All right, you already have it. Well, that's fine. But you need electricity. You need to pay for power unless you plug into the university's electricity. Don't do that. Okay. Uh, I, I saw news of uh, a few weeks ago. Someone had access to a supercomputer in the U.S. and they will use that to mine coins. They weren't bitcoins, they were something else. And, th and they got caught. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so they're using the, the, the university resources to make some money on the side. 
and they got caught, and I, I don't know what happened to them, but it wasn't nice, I suspect. Uh, they got fired, at least. Well, yeah. yeah. Okay, but you're still you're using resources, you're using electricity uh, and compute resources of others. So uh, it costs to mine. So why do it? Two reasons. Every block, you're allowed to include one special Coinbase transaction. And a Coinbase transaction is one where there's no input, there's just a single output. And that you put that output to be you. That is, when you mine a block, you set one special transaction to say, give me 25 Bitcoin. So whenever you create the block, you receive 25 Bitcoin for free. So this is the mining, that's the benefit. The reward changes over time. So currently it's 25 Bitcoin, later it will halve down to 12 and a half. Every four years. Yeah, so about every four years, it was some time period. So the reward changes over time. Another reward is that some transactions include fees. I create a transaction. I want it to be processed very quickly. So I include a fee in there saying anyone who mines a block that includes my transaction, they can have this fee. Okay. So that encourages people to create the blocks. Especially when the reward from here goes down to very low in the future, how do you get people to create the blocks? Well, increase your transaction fee. If you don't include a transaction fee, then maybe your transaction may take one hour, two hours. If you include a high fee, people will include that quickly and it will be processed faster. Okay. That's the motivation there. Uh, let's go straight to some statistics to finish, I think. And they're in other slides, you don't have them in front of you, but I've just stole a bunch of things from different websites. Some of the websites here you can find. One Bitcoin yesterday was 646 US dollars or about 21,000 baht. So that's the value of one Bitcoin. So mining a block gives you 25 Bitcoin, which is about $16,000 if you mine the block. Uh, the, you can have fractions, okay? You don't have to deal in Bitcoins. You have decimal places. So you can have milli Bitcoins, micro Bitcoins. The lowest is a Satoshi that's named after the guy who created it. And there are 10 to the power of 8 of them in one Bitcoin. So that's the lowest denomination that we have. Uh, all right, this is some graphs of prices. So Bitcoin to US dollars over, over time. This is, I did this yesterday over the past 24 hours. So you see the scale, sorry, it's hard to see. This is $640, 6, 650. So over a day, it, it's ranging between $640 to $650. So it varies quite a lot. It's quite volatile at the moment. This is over the last one week. So 650 up here, 575. One week ago, one Bitcoin was $575. So you sent someone one Bitcoin to do some work one week ago thinking it was $575. They redeem the Bitcoin today and they get uh, $650. So like with any currency, uh, the, uh, the, the, the changes uh, can create problems. And over different times, one month, one year, one year ago in the order of tens of dollars. One Bitcoin. So if you bought or if you mined one Bitcoin then, or someone gave you one Bitcoin one year ago, because they were nice to you, now it's worth $650. It peaked at about $1,000, $1,200. Okay. So it's changed quite a lot. And it's, only, it's been running for about five years. So that's the, the value over time. Some other statistics from a different website. Transactions per block. We say we group transactions into one block. Currently, there's about 400 transactions per block. It's up to the person who creates the block to do it. The fees may impact on which ones they include and whether the transactions have been received. There's no limit there. Orphan blocks are those blocks in, in a chain. Remember, we get a chain 
and one of them has to be discarded once the other chain is accepted. That discarded block and all those discarded transactions is called an orphaned block. Over time, over the last one or two, or two years, how many have there been? One, two, three, four. So there haven't been many forks in the chain. So here there was a fork where there were four orphan blocks. So the chain was four long and eventually they had to be discarded. Okay. So it doesn't happen very often, but it's starting to maybe happen a bit more. This is the hash rate. So for every block, uh, what, how, how many hashes per second that you need to do? Remember we do a, a SHA-256 hash. It took my computer, well my computer could do one million per second. This is the rate of the network, not of a single computer, but of when people mine in groups usually, how many hashes per second are they doing? Giga hashes per second, not mega. One billion hashes per second. What's the number? 120 million giga hashes per second. Okay, that's the, what, 10 to the power of 17 or whatever hashes per second. My computer can do 10 to the power of 6 per second, but people, when they combine together in groups, are doing something like 10 to the power of 17 hashes per second. So they're using many, many computers, and they're not using general purpose computers, they're using dedicated hardware. And the difficulty factor rises as the hash rate rises to keep things always about 10 minutes. Even though we can hash faster, it still takes 10 minutes to get the block. The miners, how do they make money? They get this 25 Bitcoin reward plus transaction fees. Transaction fees are a very small part, maybe a few percent or one percent of the total reward. So it's mainly the, the 25 Bitcoin. This is how much in terms of US dollars miners get per day. So uh, what's this, around two million, three million, two and a half million US dollars reward distributed. Now, mining is not done by a single person anymore. It takes me 22 centuries if I do it myself. What I do is I join a, join a group, a, a pool, and we all join together to mine one block. When we get that block, that 25 Bitcoin is distributed to everyone who contributed. So I don't get 25 Bitcoin, I just get a fraction of that. Uh, I think it, dep it depends upon how much you contribute to the mining. So let's say all of us join a group. If I have the fastest computer that contributes the most hashes, then I will get the largest fraction of the Bitcoin. But we'd, we'd share it. Uh, where do we get to? Some statistics. How many blocks in the blockchain? 300,000 currently. So it's just one long chain of blocks. And how many bitcoins? About 13 million bitcoins have been mined from people creating new blocks. The current reward per block is 25, <coughs> but it goes down every few years. The difficulty factor. In the past 24 hours, this was yesterday, there were 143 blocks added to the chain so per day, times by 25 is three and a half thousand bitcoins mined, about on average 10 minutes between blocks. It varies, sometimes it's 15 minutes, sometimes it's less, but on average it keeps to around 10 minutes. Transactions, 66,000. Transaction fees, very small. Of all those transactions, the fees were 12 bitcoin, but there were three and a half thousand bitcoins in reward. So the transaction fees don't account for much. People estimate how many, what's the value of all those transactions and people say about 100 million bitcoins. And the hash rate, similar to what we saw before, this 120, 120 million giga hashes per second. To finish, I think one, maybe two slides. Mining hardware, okay? You want to create your own bitcoins, so you mine. That is, you create blocks. What are the hardware options? Well, use your general purpose CPU. Use my laptop or desktop computer. 
the rates at which CPUs work, and this is rough, so plus or minus uh, an order of magnitude, but mega hashes per second, you need to pay for electricity. So mega hashes per second per watt that that hardware uses, and you need to pay for the device. So mega hashes per second per dollar. So we want these to be large. A CPU, you're talking about the order of 10 mega hashes per second. Mine's a laptop, maybe you can get a faster CPU. Mine was one. GPUs at one stage were uh, very well suited to calculating hashes, or they still are, okay? the, the graphics card. And they could do about 100 mega hashes per second. They use more power, but the, the ratio was quite good compared to your CPU. So many people use the graphics cards, video cards, to do the hash calculations. But then people thought, OK, let's get some dedicated hardware. GPUs and CPUs are just general purpose hardware for other purposes. FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays. You basically buy uh, some uh, some general purpose integrated circuits and you program them to do some special operations. The operations are calculating hashes. Much faster than GPUs. About the same in terms of the, the ratios of power usage and, and, and value. Then, okay, instead of buying general purpose uh, integrated circuits, get someone to make an integrated circuit for you that specifically calculates hashes. ASICs, application specific integrated circuits. You go to a company and you say, I'm going to buy uh, 100,000 integrated circuits if you program it, make it this way. An FPGA, you could go to a company and say, I want to buy one. Maybe it's expensive, or I don't know, $10,000. You buy one of these and you program it or someone programs it to calculate hashes. An ASIC, ASIC maybe costs a million dollars to create. But once you design and create it, they're very, very cheap. So to buy in bulk is very cheap compared to FPGAs. And because it's dedicated hardware just for one specific problem, we're talking about nowadays around 1 million mega hashes per second. And much more efficient in terms of power consumption and, and the cost of the hardware. So nowadays to mine, Using a CPU, you'll never get the reward. Someone will always beat you to it because someone has faster hardware. Even using a GPU, you will not get the reward. Someone will beat you to it because someone else has an ASIC, which goes much, much faster. And more so, even doing it yourself, people don't just do it themselves, they join a group. So doing it yourself, you probably need you know, uh, tens, hundreds of these devices, which may cost $100,000, I mean, a total of $100,000, just to mine one Bitcoin, which returns $16,000. Okay, so people join groups, and it's called pool mining. There's a greater chance of winning, but of course you must share that reward amongst everyone else in the pool. And to finish one more, ah. There are alternatives. Cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin's the popular one, there are others. Bitcoin uses SHA-256, there are others, Namecoin and others, so there are many. Okay, I just selected some popular ones here. They have different characteristics. Uh, so some are newer, or most are newer, therefore there's um, maybe more reward in mining, more chance of winning, less people working on it but maybe there's less chance in the future of being valuable. So there's maybe more risk associated with it. So there are many different ones. Some use different hash algorithms. Well, you go and spend your thousands of dollars on some buying some integrated circuits that work for Bitcoin. It only works for Bitcoin, or it only works for SHA-256. It will not work for coins which use different hash algorithms because it's designed specifically for that hash algorithm. So it's not valuable for other things. Some are designed to be slow on integrated circuits so that people 
cannot get advantage by just getting better and better hardware. Slow such that they still, you can mine you with a, a CPU. Okay? So they have different characteristics, but uh, many similarities to Bitcoin. How to make money? I have no idea. Okay? So, well, uh, these, these change, yeah, so the value of these change over time. Um, Bitcoin is still the largest, but uh, other the new ones are, are growing to some extent. Um, there are many issues with the financial side, which we just don't have time or, or the knowledge to discuss. I think with the aim to finish at 12 o'clock, uh, we're five minutes behind. Ah, this is something that we asked about and briefly mentioned. So you receive a transaction. When do you trust that you've got the money? The general rule is after six blocks have been confirmed. Okay, so your software will be programmed to say, so you're, I'm running some Bitcoin software, a wallet. Someone has transferred me Bitcoins. My wallet will wait for the network to confirm six more blocks before it shows up saying, oh, you've got 10 more Bitcoins, okay? So it, it, uh, some extra confirmation such that they're unlikely for your transaction to be rejected later. If you mine Bitcoins, it's set to 100 blocks. You mine, you must wait 100 blocks before you spend it, okay? So what's that, uh, 15 hours or so. Anonymous. Are you anonymous? Every transaction is recorded. Who sends to who is recorded. Okay? So that's not anonymous. But what is recorded? Well, the hash of the public key of users, or, or generally the public key of users. So even though I can see this public key sent to this public key at this time, this amount of money, do I know that it was Steve sending to Tanara? Well, if I can map the public key back to an identity, yes. But if we start to use many different public keys, it's much, much harder for someone to map back to an identity. Okay, so that's where it can become anonymous by well, using multiple. In the FBI and uh, took down Silk Road, mm. I think they proved that it, it's not as hard as it previously thought to track down Bitcoin. I, I think, so Bitcoin is being used in different places and one website was Silk Road for selling drugs and, and murdering people and so on. Uh, but I think when they, usually when the FBI takes down things like that, they use not just the, they don't break the crypt cryptographic principles here, they usually just get information from other sources. And they have resources mm. that maybe not everyone has, mm. still, I think Right, if, if you've got software on your computer and someone gets that software, then they've got your public ID and they can match that public key ID to your, your name, okay? Uh, but if they've just got your public ID, uh, your public key, they're mapping that to your name, if you use multiple public keys, it can be very, very hard. But if you collect other information, yes, it, it's, it's possible. So remember, all transactions are logged, so that's not anonymous. It's whether or not someone can map your public key to your actual identity. And that takes different techniques. Uh, that's it. Okay. Uh,